In the previous lecture, we've looked at certain processes and psychic processes which uh, obey the first law, but some of those processes are not practically possible. And we've done that to motivate the need for the second law of thermodynamics because there are many processes that do not violate the first law of thermodynamics but still are not observed in practice and that's because they do not conform to the second law of thermodynamics. So in the run up to introducing the second law of thermodynamics in this lecture we look at an important uh, set of devices which are the heat engine, refrigerator and heat pump and we uh, want to discuss these heat engines and refrigerators before we introduce the second law of thermodynamics because firstly we'll be able to motivate the second law of thermodynamics better using these devices and moreover during our discussion on the second law of thermodynamics we'll keep on invoking these heat engines and therefore it is necessary that we discuss heat engines in a bit more detail and refrigerators also in more detail before we proceed to introducing the second law of thermodynamics. Now what is a heat engine? So heat engine is a device that operates in a thermodynamic cycle and does net work on the surroundings and to do this work the heat engine takes heat from a high temperature body and rejects heat to a low temperature body. So heat engine is a device that operates in a thermodynamic cycle and does net work on the surroundings through transfer of heat from a high temperature body and to a low temperature body. To understand th what this heat engine is, let us look at a very simple heat engine and uh, using that we'll be able to understand this definition clearly. So now let's consider a simple heat engine. So this heat engine consists of this piston cylinder arrangement where we have this cylinder that is fitted with let's say frictionless piston and this cylinder is provided with these stops so that this piston cannot move below this position and cannot move above this position and on this piston let's say this whole thing is our piston and on this piston there is some weight w that is kept now within this piston cylinder arrangement we have a gas now this is the initial state of the gas and now what we do is that first in the first step we'll bring in a high temperature body in thermal contact with this system that is the cylinder and this heat is transferred to the gas. Now let's say this gas expands and the piston rises up and the piston touches these stops and because these pist this piston is touching this stop it cannot move further. Now let's say that we do not heat this gas anymore and in the next step what we will do is that we will simply transfer this weight away from this piston so this weight is no longer on this piston 
and you may also consider that piston also has some mass. But when we remove this weight, this piston cannot move up further because this piston is touching the stop. So what we've done in this step is that we've added heat to the gas, the gas has expanded, then the piston lifts up the weight and now we have removed this weight. In the next step, what we do now is bring a low temperature body in contact with this gas or the system and as a result there is heat transfer from the gas to this low temperature body. Consequently this gas is compressed because the piston itself has some mass and let's say the gas compresses and the piston returns back to the original position where we started from the initial state and the gas also comes back to the same state and now we remove this low temperature body so we are back to the initial state so what we've seen is that this system undergoes a cycle and returns back to its original state and in this process, what this system has done is the net effect of this system is that it has raised certain weight during this whole cyclic process. And therefore, we can say that this system that is operating in a thermodynamic cycle has done certain work. And for such a system, the work done on the system is going to be negative because this system does positive work on the surroundings and to do this work what are the heat transfers that have taken place so this system takes in heat from a high temperature body and in part of the cycle it rejects the heat to a low temperature body but because the system does work let's write the first law so delta e is equal to q plus w now we have a cyclic process so this is zero because of the cyclic process and we know that the system has done some work so minus w is positive because in our notation work done on the system is taken to be positive so minus w is equal to q and what is q q is the heat that was transferred from the hot body to the system and heat that was rejected from the gas to the cold body now because the system has done positive work on the surroundings clearly it consumes some net heat. So the net heat is input to the system so that the system does work on the surroundings. So QH is greater than QC. So this example is a very simple form of a heat engine. So again, let's look at the definition. So our heat engine that we looked at in this example Clearly, it works in a thermodynamic cycle because the gas returns back to its original state. And this system does net work on the surroundings. And in this uh, process, in this cyclic process, this heat engine has taken heat from a high temperature body and it has also rejected heat to a low temperature body. So, such a device that operates in a thermodynamic cycle and does work by taking net heat input from a high temperature body while rejecting heat to a low temperature body is called a heat engine. Now, you may also ask that why do we need to reject heat? Because the first law says that 
we can still have heat input to the system, let's say from a hot uh, temperature body, and still do work. And first law allows us to do so. But later on, we'll see that it is not possible to operate a heat engine in a cycle without rejecting heat to the surroundings. And for that, we'll have to look at the second law of thermodynamics. Therefore, in other words, the heat engine cannot operate in a cyclic uh, process without rejecting heat to a low temperature body. Uh, why so? We shall see later in the upcoming lectures. Now, in general, we can illustrate a heat engine with a diagram something like this where we have a body that is maintained at high temperature, heat is transferred to this heat engine that is working in a cycle and this heat engine does net work and in this cycle it also rejects heat to a low temperature body. And just to avoid confusion with our sign convention, we can just say that the work done by the system in this case is positive. So we put this absolute sign for the work that is output from this system. Now, so typically these uh, high temperature and low temperature bodies with which a heat engine exchanges heat are considered to remain at constant temperature. So typically we'll say that that this temperature is constant that is th and the temperature of the low temperature body remains at tc. So such high temperature and low temperature bodies whose temperature remains constant and that's possible only if they have infinite heat capacities and that means heat can be transferred from these bodies without any change in temperatures of these high temperature and low temperature bodies and such bodies are called as thermal reservoirs. So this is a thermal reservoir at high temperatures and this is a thermal reservoir maintained at low temperature. Examples of thermal reservoirs can be ocean or atmosphere. A body that is let's say heated to keep the temperature fixed may also be considered as a thermal reservoir because you can transfer heat from such a body to the engine while maintaining that particular body at a fixed uh, temperature. So such a body can also be called as a thermal reservoir. Now often um, we'll have these reservoirs, let's say reservoir from which heat is being transferred is often called a source and the reservoir to which heat is being rejected is called a sink and for a heat engine the source is at high temperature and sink is at low temperature but it's not necessary that always source is at high temperature and sink is at low temperature and we'll see that the opposite is the case in a refrigerator but for the heat engine the high temperature body is the source and low temperature body is the sink because heat is being rejected to the sink and heat is being transferred from the source to the heat engine that is operating in a cycle. So we have seen one simple example of a heat engine and in form of this reciprocating machine where the piston goes up and down and in process lifts this weight W. But there are so many devices which can be classified in this general definition of 
a heat engine. For example, a steam power plant also fits our description of a heat engine. So a steam power plant takes heat from a high temperature body and it rejects heat to a low temperature body and it delivers work. So let's consider this steam power plant. So we call that a steam power plant in a simplified way can be thought of as having a boiler which heats up water and that water forms steam that is fed to a turbine which delivers net positive work and the steam that exits this turbine so this is our turbine it goes into a condenser where heat is rejected and then the steam condenses to a liquid phase and this liquid is again that is water is fed back to the boiler now if you look at this steam power plant what we are doing is that we are transferring heat to the system which is the working substance uh, in the boiler and this system rejects heat in the condenser section to the cooling water and in the boiler it is taking up heat from the high temperature products of combustion and we get net work from this steam power plant so if we consider this whole system again we see that this steam power plant fits our description of a heat engine because we are taking in heat from a source and operating in a cycle to deliver network and we are also dumping heat to a cold reservoir so the reservoir that is cold reservoir in this particular case for a steam power plant is the coolant water let's say taken from a river or some big lake so a steam power plant also fits the description of a heat engine however often the term heat engine is used in a broader sense for any device that produces work either through heat transfer or combustion even though the device does not operate in a thermodynamic cycle but strictly speaking heat engine is a device that works in thermodynamic cycle so sometimes you may hear that internal combustion engine is also a heat engine it can be called as a heat engine although strictly speaking it doesn't operate in a thermodynamic cycle in our discussion of the second law of thermodynamics we will consider heat engines that are strictly operating on a thermodynamic cycle and an internal combustion engine does not fit into that picture of a heat engine now let's consider this heat engine which could be this steam power plant also now we want to look at the performance of this heat engine and the performance of this heat engine is described in terms of the thermal efficiency so by thermal efficiency which we'll denote by the symbol eta is what we want to get out of this heat engine so the energy that we want to use from this heat engine is the net work and that is the output of the heat engine and what is the energy that costs us money to run this engine that is the heat that is 
transferred from the high temperature body to this uh, uh, engine so therefore efficiency is defined as the work done by this system operating in a thermodynamic cycle and let's say this is work done in one cycle divided by the heat that is transferred to the system in that particular cycle you can also write in terms of the rates so if the system is operating continuously so uh, then the efficiency would be the rate at which work is being done over the rate at which you are supplying heat from a high temperature reservoir to the heat engine now from the first law we already know that this work is equal to qh minus ql because for the cyclic process uh, we will not have any change in internal energy and the work that is done is equal to the net heat that we have supplied to this heat engine so the efficiency or the thermal efficiency of the heat engine is given by this expression which can also be written as 1 minus ql over qh and note that when we have this expression of thermal efficiency it may be for any working fluid we've not invoked any type of uh, specific type of working fluid as of now so this definition is very general so the typical thermal efficiency of let's say a large thermal power plant and that is a steam power plant is about to 50 percent and that's for a large steam uh, power plant now one may think that if we do not dump this heat to the cold reservoir so let's say if qc is zero then we may expect that eta is going to uh, be 100 percent or efficiency will be 100 percent but that is not possible because as we'll see during our discussion of the second law of thermodynamics a heat engine cannot work without rejecting heat to a low temperature reservoir therefore there's a fundamental limit to the efficiency that these heat engines can achieve and this limit is not related to the uh, non-idle behavior of the engine for example due to leakages or friction no matter how perfect you make your heat engine there is a maximum limit to the efficiency that can be attained so this question was uh, addressed by Carnot as to what is the maximum efficiency one can attain for a heat engine uh, back in 1824 through a paper on theoretical considerations of heat engine and we'll discuss Carnot's approach in the upcoming lectures and we'll use that approach to uh, mathematically formulate the second law of thermodynamics as of now we need to understand that the first law does not stop you from having a heat engine with 100% efficiency but in practice no matter how perfect heat engine you make there is an upper limit on its thermal efficiency and that limit comes from the second law of thermodynamics so that's why we need to study the second law of thermodynamics now before we can introduce the second law that we are going to do in the next lecture we also want to look at another device that is a refrigerator or a heat pump so it depends upon the application that you're using whether you want to call it a refrigerator or a heat pump and we'll look into that so a refrigerator 
is a device that does opposite of what a heat engine does. So heat engine takes heat from a high temperature body and dumps heat to a low temperature body while doing positive work on the surroundings. Whereas a refrigerator, which we'll show schematically over here, again works by transferring heat to or from uh, to let's say reservoirs kept at high temperature Th and low temperature Tc and refrigerator also works on a thermodynamic cycle but it differs from a heat pump in a way that it consumes work and it takes heat let's say QC from a low temperature reservoir and transfers it to a high temperature reservoir and it transfers heat QH to a high temperature reservoir. Now if you do work on a refrigerator which is operating in thermodynamic cycle then this delta E that is equal to Q plus W is equal to 0 and what is Q? The net heat input is QC minus QH and the left hand side is 0 because we are working in a thermodynamic cycle. So the work that is done on this refrigerator let's say over one cycle is equal to QH minus QC. So clearly because we are doing positive work on the system QH is greater than QC. Now this same device can be called as a refrigerator or a heat pump depending upon what you are using this device for. So if you are using this device to cool a refrigerated space then it's called a refrigerator. However if you let's say are using device to heat up a particular space for example outside is cold and you are using this device to heat up a room then we will call this device as a heat pump. So the device is same just depending upon the application we will either call it as a refrigerator or a heat pump. Now we have looked at the performance of a heat engine is described in terms of the efficiency but the so called efficiency of a refrigerator is expressed in terms of not efficiency but in terms of what we call as the coefficient of performance. Which we'll abbreviate as COP. So let's look at COP of a refrigerator. So COP is what we are interested in a refrigerator is how much heat it is removing from a low temperature space for a particular amount of work. So COP of a refrigerator is defined as QC over W and our W is QH minus QC and therefore we can also write this as 1 over QH by QC minus 1. So this is COP of a refrigerator and that's how we quantify the performance of a refrigerator. So COP of a refrigerator can be greater than 1. It can be less than 1 as well uh, depending upon the values of these uh, heat that is transferred between the high temperature and low temperature reservoir. So typical COP of a domestic refrigerator is about 2.5. On the other hand, COP of a heat pump is defined differently because when we talk of a heat pump, our objective is to heat a particular space. So COP of a heat pump is defined as the heat that is transferred to a high temperature reservoir over the work that is required to 
operate the heat pump in a cycle. So again, we can write in terms of the heats uh, transferred. So W is equal to QH minus QC. So we can write COP of a heat pump is 1 minus QC over QH. Firstly, note that COP of a heat pump is always going to be greater than 1 because QC by QH is always less than 1. Therefore, the denominator is always going to be less than 1 and therefore COP of a heat pump is always going to be greater than 1. But COP of a refrigerator can be greater or can be less than 1 depending upon the values of QC and QH. And if you look at these two definitions of coefficient of performance of refrigerator and heat pump, we can also write so note that the COP, we can also write COP of heat pump, which is QH over QH minus QC can be related with the COP of a refrigerator. So COP of a refrigerator is given by this. So if we subtract the COP of a heat pump and that of a refrigerator. So clearly this is equal to 1. So therefore because COP is going to be positive for the refrigerator. So this relation also clearly shows that COP of a heat pump is always going to be greater than 1. Now one example of a refrigerator we've already discussed during our introduction to this course that is a refrigerator or an air conditioner that is working on a vapor compression cycle. But that's not the only type of refrigerator. You can have refrigerators working on different cycles as well. Now, similar to a heat engine, we can ask, is there a fundamental limit to how high COP can be attained? Because our uh, aim should be to obtain as high COP as possible. That means as high heat transfer for a unit amount of work done to operate this uh, refrigerator or a heat pump. So one would uh, like to run this uh, refrigerator or a heat pump with infinite COP because if we can transfer large amount of heat with doing negligible amount of work that would be very beneficial. But even though the first law does not prohibit us from doing so, but the second law does put a fundamental limit on how high the coefficient of performance that one can attain. So in summary, the first law does not prohibit us from having a heat engine with efficiency of 100% or the COP of a refrigerator to be infinite. But second law puts an upper limit on the performance of these devices. So now you've understood why second law is so important. So with this background, in the next lecture, we are going to introduce the second law of thermodynamics. And during our discussion of second law, we'll keep on invoking heat engines. So this discussion of heat engines that we have done in this lecture and the refrigerators will be helpful in understanding the second law and also for mathematical formulation of the second law of thermodynamics.